شعت شموس الهدي بالكلمات فنارت الأفهام بالآيات أسرج بنور العلم عقلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على عدائهم أجمعين Among the most important necessities seminary students need or all human beings in general in their life, regardless of their professions and their origins, we need to have tolerance. There are two verses in the Holy Quran, among other verses that covers this specific subject. The verse where the Almighty Allah addresses the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, in chapter 94, the Surah Al-Inshirah, the relief. Allah says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, meaning did we not expand your chest? Expanding the chest refers to an Arabic allegory which represents tolerance. The greatness of this blessing that Allah granted his beloved messenger is represented in the fact that Allah has named the entire chapter in the Quran by the name the relief, al inshirah. There is a discussion which we must discuss in other occasion, which is about the names of the Quranic chapters. For instance, why is chapter 2 in the Holy Quran named the cow? There is a theory about the naming of the chapters which requires vertification and more substantiation. The abstract of this theory is that each name in the chapter of the Quran represents a central core and an angle that the chapter addresses and covers. Just like a lecture, it needs a hypothesis and a core, and any book has a hypothesis and a core. The Quranic chapters are all the same, where all the verses in the Holy Quran in the chapter revolves around that core issue. Therefore, the second chapter of the Quran Al-Baqarah has a hypothesis and a core, and this core revolves around the story of the cow. In any case, the reasons and rationals behind the naming of chapters require another discussion. We will just point out that the naming of each chapter outlines a core angle that is found within that chapter. Another theory states that the name of each chapter reflects the general subject carried by the contents of that chapter. It is widely accepted that each name of a Quranic chapter must have a great importance that led to the sentence of that name. We have a chapter in the Holy Quran that is named the relief, al-inshirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Did we not expand your chest? In this verse, Allah is speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The verse refers, refers to the notion of tolerance. This is a blessing that Allah has granted his holy Prophet. And we removed from you your burden. Which has weighed upon your back. وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ And has raised your repute up high. We realize an orderly sequence that exists in those three verses. In the first one is that the fact that Allah has expanded the chest of the Prophet and granted him with tolerance. The second one is that and he removed and we removed from you your burden which has led upon your weight, which has weighted upon your back. Burden is also defined as weight, which means Allah has lifted the weights from his messenger. Imagine managing a family consisting of three members. We are talking about here a complete and proper management. Unlike parents who neglect their families and children, you only want to manage a family that has three members. How much would the parents bear and suffer for the, for the sake? 
of this family. Some children actually, they tire their parents and truly some parents age older because of their children. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has assigned this great responsibility, the prophethood, which is the greatest responsibility and obligation in history in the universe. It is a responsibility that is guiding mankind until the day of resurrection. In that complicated environment, which has filled with contradictions, how did the Prophet endure and bear those burdens and weights? And when I say the complicated environment, I am referring to the Arabian and pre-Islamic era. How did the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, tolerate those burdens? And how were they lifted from him? Was, what was the essence of placing those burdens and lifting them? Did the lifting of an external nature to it? Or was the meaning, was it a meaning of an actual physical lifting of the weights and burdens? Or did the lifting have an internal nature? Feeling, which means it is a metaphor that refers to psychological aid from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the time of hardship, most likely it's a metaphor. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted the burdens. It had an internal nature because the hardships of the Prophet never decreased. They were consistently increasing due to his responsibility and obligations. Therefore, how did this lifting of burdens occur? And we removed from you your burden which had led weight upon your back. When you carry something heavy on your back, it makes a crack sound in which in Arabic it's called anqadha. The Prophet was able to tolerate those burdens because he had a great and tolerant heart. A man with such a heart would always face hardships and heavy burdens. Let's give an example here. You take a small stone and you drop it in the pond. You will notice that the water would ripple and there would be waves in the water. And if you put so much rocks, the water will overflow. However, drop hundreds of thousands of rocks in a sea. The sea would contain and take all of them. No one has a life free of hassles. Does a scholar live without hardships? Does a woman live without hardships? Does a man live without hardships? Does a merchant live without hardships? Everyone has hardships. Yet, by having a great and tolerant heart, those hardships can be contained. If we were able to use a realistic example for this notion, it would be best to represent or to present through a weak and strong body. So a person with a weak body was once told by his physician that you should not even lift a book, a book. With 100 pages, he could not lift. He did not have the strength to lift that book. But there are people who are able to pick up 100 kilos of weight. So the issue of lifting itself is not the problem. The person who is lifting heavy weight has a physical capability and bears the weight. A great and tolerant heart is similar to that example. Regardless of the size and the extent of a problem, the heart will always be bigger and stronger. Sometimes it would appear that those people, they don't even have hardships. Hardships don't even exist in that person's life. Look at the great people in history who have a great and tolerant heart. It seems like that they don't have any problems. And the hardships in their lives Yet they actually swamp through, through the most difficult and challenging hardships. This is how the heart of a tolerant becomes. Therefore, the first step we have to learn is to keep our hearts big 
In other words, our chest relief. As what the Holy Quran says and describes Sharh al-Sadr, meaning being tolerant. The second stage is lifting your burdens. As described earlier, the concept of lifting those burdens can be internal in nature, with psychological aspects, where the burdens and weight are not felt by the person. In addition, the lifting can be external as well, which basically means hardships and burdens are not felt by the person or will collapse before the person who has tolerance. The third stage, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ And raised high for you your repute. Let's pay attention to the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted His Holy Prophet. Allah has given His divine name to the Prophet in the two testimonies of Islam, which any person testifying to Islam must testify to are La ilaha illallah meaning no God but Allah. Wa Muhammadun Rasulullah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You find the same in the Adhan, in Tashahud, during your prayers, as they both contain the two testimonies of Islam. The Quran also states that the same association, it states, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And another verse states and says that Allah and His Messenger has enriched them of His bounty. There are these three stages, tolerance, sa'at al-sadr, lifting the burdens, wad al-wizr, and the third stage, elevating repute, waraf al-dhikr. These three stages are sequential stages. The three Quranic verses which we mentioned addresses the notion of expanding the chest, tolerance. We also have in another verse, that the Holy Quran addresses the opposite notion. The Almighty Allah states in His Holy Book, يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ The translation of this verse, He makes His chest tight, constricted through as He were climbing into the skies. This applies to some individuals. It is said that this verse is one of the miracles of the Holy Quran as this verse was not well understood until science came along and has clarified its meaning. Modern science states that the breathable air is layered by pressure and therefore we are able to breathe. However, at a higher altitude, the destiny and pressure of air decreases and this results in having difficulty breathing. Hence, if someone goes up several kilometers up high, he or she is not able to breathe. And this was not a familiar concept in the previous era because breathing will be very difficult. And if one continues to go up higher, breathing will be so difficult that one will faint. And Allah said in the Quran, يَجْعَلَ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ the verse says, he makes his chest tight, constricted through as he were climbing into the sky. This verse is truly amazing because even the pronunciation of this verse is kind of difficult. It's like trying to breathe with little oxygen. The word yasa'adu, which means to ascend to the sky in Arabic is actually difficult to pronounce. There are some people who cannot tolerate anything. They cannot tolerate their kids. They cannot tolerate their home. They cannot tolerate society. They cannot tolerate customers. They can't tolerate anything. Similar to someone who has asthma. They can't breathe. They suffocate. These Quranic verses which I mentioned, those that speak of expanding the chest and constricting the chest, represents the opposite side of this topic. And there is another other Quranic verse that addresses this topic as well. However, we will move on to another topic, which is the scope and issue that requires tolerance, 
we will mention them briefly. Firstly, the intellectual aspect. There was one man who left the seminary, the Hawza. He was asked, why did you leave the seminary of studying? He said he was still a sheikh, a clergy, yet he did not attend classes anymore. He replied saying, I do not have stamina for studying anymore and gaining knowledge. Gaining knowledge and studying requires stamina and tolerance. Imagining a person swamped with social problems and yet he or she has to come to the seminary, the hawza, and study a very hard concept like this, the definition of literal interpolation. Literal interpolation is a suffocated seminary subject. With the studies of Arabic literature and subjects and principles. You have to find the difference, the different definitions of literal interpretation. There are four definitions. The first definition has three proofs. The first proofs have two rebuttals. And the first rebuttal has two several debates and defenses. Do you really think that many people have patience for such a topic or such a subject? Therefore, therefore you see many students that start studying with passion they gradually, their passion weakens until suddenly they leave studying and they leave school. Gaining knowledge and studying requires a big tolerant heart. This is the first aspect. The second aspect is the supplicatory aspect. The devotional side of prayers and supplications Devotion and prayer requires a great and tolerant heart. For instance, one of the scholars of Bahrain tells a heartbreaking story. He says, I never used to perform the recommended prayers after the obligation prayers. So Salat and Nawafil, he never used to perform those prayers because it requires devotion. Imagine you have to pray your recommended prayer, the obligatory one, and then the mustahab and nawafil the recommended one. So he said that I never used to pray those prayers until one day I was led in a masjid to pray Salat al-Jama'ah. And I witnessed a smith, which is a haddad. He prayed those nawafil, those recommended prayers. He said, I don't do anything all day. All I do is read or grab a pen and a pencil and write. And this smith who works in very hard and hot temperatures has the ability and the devotion to actually pray those nawafil, those recommended prayers. Have you seen how bakers and blacksmiths suffer in the holy month of Ramadan? Yet they still have to pray the nawafil, the morning nawafil, the afternoon nawafil. And he said, I don't perform them. And I'm just a scholar who reads books. From that day, he began praying the nawafil prayers after his obligatory salah. Indeed, such people are a testament against us on the day of judgment. One student once came to a scholar and he told him, I have difficulty waking up for the morning salah, for the salat subh the morning prayers at 6 a.m. How can I solve this issue? The scholar replied to him and he said to him, once you wake up at 6 a.m., remember that there are people who are awake at 3 a.m., studying and praying, supplicating. From now on, if you wake up at 6 a.m., always keep in your mind that there is someone who's awake at 3 a.m. And if you are awake at 3 a.m. to study and supplicate, remember that there is someone who's awake from midnight till morning, studying and supplicating. Therefore, no matter how much a person works and strives, there's always someone who works more. It is said that one of the great verses in the Holy Quran regarding the recommendation of gaining knowledge, it says, وَفَوْقَ كُلَّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Over every processor of knowledge is one more knowing. 
Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi, may Allah have mercy on him. He said it on a motivational statement. He said, we have ran our entire lives and haven't gotten anywhere. I wonder where the people who haven't ran at all be. This is a believer's sense of feeling. It means that if you, as a believer, ran and dedicated his entire life and became the most knowledgeable scholar, he must remember that above him exists a one more knowledgeable scholar. وَفَوْقَ كُلَّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Those who have achieved their goals were like us one day. Imam al-Sadiq said, Upon what basis have you established your affairs? Some establish their affairs based on the notion that they will endure everything. And other establish their affairs and bases and others establish their bases on not enduring anything. This was the second point. The intellectual aspect and the supplicatory aspect both require a tolerant and great big heart. This was the second point. The intellectual aspect and the supplicatory aspect both require great and tolerant hearts. Thirdly, the administrational aspect also requires a great and tolerant heart. Imam Ali السلام, tells his companion Kumail ibn Ziyad, Kumail the son of Ziyad, Imam Ali السلام, says to Kumail ibn Ziyad, Inna hadhi al-qulub These hearts and vessels are the best one of them, are the ones containing. The containing mentioned in this narration can be academic and one can be practical. One must establish and build upon endurance and tolerance. He or she should establish her house, her husband, the children, the society. There's a great scholar who lived around 100 years ago. The story was narrated by a student of his who was also a scholar. He said that his scholar suffered with his spouse. Some of us, we have issues with our spouse, and yet we get tired, and yet we don't have tolerance. We don't understand the basics of life. But he had a problem with his spouse, but he was willing to cooperate. We tend to expect that others should understand us fully. This is unrealistic. This would be similar to expecting an infant to comprehend the same way as an adult will. This will never happen. The scholar says that this what his wife doomed his life to an extent that she consumed half of his life. Yet he was very tolerant with her. And the story that was narrated about the scholar, his student says that his wife was obsessed with subsition, extreme subsition. She did not trust anyone or believe anyone but her husband, who was a scholar, apparently. And apparently she seemed that she was ill and she was managing and he was managing her affairs and needs. Therefore, the scholar spent half of his life meeting the needs of his wife and addressing to them. For example, one of them that was mentioned was that she, they lived in Najaf and they had a very deep basement. And in that basement, there was a big container of water. So the wife came to a point where she assumed that the water in the container is impure. So she came up with an idea to bring that container and to purify it and then return it back. So it needed a handyman to be hired to lift it up that heavy container of water to the courtyard and then to purify it. Then for a moment she was like, what if that handyman's shoes and feet are dirty and it's impure? His hands might be impure. Therefore, the whole entire house will be impure. So, and she's very thin. So she said to her husband that, you have to go down to the basement, bring that container of water to the courtyard, 
purify it and return it back. How many of us can handle that? This is a scholar, but he had a big and tolerant heart. Others might not be like the scholar and others may end up divorcing their wife. Wasn't the prophet capable to divorce a couple of his wives in the early days of his marriage? The society has certain expectations and society does not comprehend that you might have hardships in life. Nonetheless, society might put pressure on a person with expectations by not having a great and tolerant heart, that one would not be able to tolerate and endure the society and its challenges. And it is narrated that is, there is one scholar named Shaykh Zayn al-Abideen al-Mazindarani. Once he was on his way to visit Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam's shrine, and a poor man, a beggar, came up to him and approached him and he said to him that I want money. And that man was from the progeny of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So he was a Sayyid. And he asked him for some money. Now the Shaykh said, I'm on my way to the ziyara and I don't have money with me. However, once I'm done from my ziyara, come to my house and I will give you money. That beggar did not leave the Shaykh. He kept begging and begging until he got mad and he had no patience that he spat on the Sheikh's face. The people who were around the Sheikh wanted to discipline him. The Sheikh said, no, leave him. That spit that he spat on me is from a Sayyid, someone from the progeny of Rasulullah. Therefore, my face will not be burnt in fire and hell. Imagine what kind of tolerance this scholar had. Once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa, go to Pharaoh and send the message, he said, Allah expand my chest. Rabbi shrahli sadri. Therefore, we have the intellectual aspects of tolerance, the supplicatory aspects, and the administrational aspects in general in life. We need to be tolerant and we need to have a big heart. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Almighty to aid us with the path. وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين. الفرد الذي له قلب كبير كلما يواجه من المشكلات وكلما يواجه من الأثقال يحتوي هذه المشكلات هذا القلب الكبير.